Hello everyone, welcome back to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. And on today's show, I'm gonna be speaking with Pastor Edsel Cadet. He is the pastor of the Cambridge SDA Church of Everett, but he's also a scholar at William James College. And he's gonna be talking to us today about how trauma affects relationships. So if that's something that's of interest to you, then keep listening. Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome back to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. I'm a psychiatrist practicing here in Massachusetts, and this is a talk show that's all about everything related to mental wellness in the black community. So at any time, if you have a question or a comment, just give us a call at 617-238-7111. That's 617-238-7111. We're also streaming live on Facebook. The Facebook page is Urban Heat 981 FM. That's Urban Heat 981 FM. If you want to see the live stream, um, you can also drop a comment there. So thank you guys for joining us. And uh, today in the studio, I have with me Pastor Edsel Cadet. So Edsel, um, he is a, a scholar at William James College. I'll have him talk a little bit more about what he is studying. Um, he's also a, a pastor at uh, the Cambridge SDA Church uh, in Everett. And uh, he's the author, a co-author of a book um, and so today we're going to be talking about trauma in relationships. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this topic. I, as you guys know, I, I, speci I specialize in working with people that have trauma, um, but I'm definitely not a relationship expert. So I'm glad that I have one here with me. Um, so Edsel, tell us a little bit more about yourself, you know, why you decided to pursue further education at, at, at WJC and tell us about your book. Okay. Um, well, great to be here. Thanks for having me on, Dr. Carrie Ann. Um, I am currently a pastor. I pastor at the Cambridge Seven Adventist Church in Everett, Massachusetts. And over the course of pastoring for the past six to eight years, I've noticed that there sometimes people face challenges in, in, re in reaching the, the spiritual heights or even the social, emotional heights that they would like to reach. And while the church does support, um, does provide a lot of support in helping people get to that place, it can be challenging um, when there are psychological issues or uh, traumatic issues from the past that are impeding their progress. So uh, after some time, and I've always had an interest in therapy and, and counseling, I've, had, I've gone to therapy myself and it's been such uh, a benefit to me, my personal life, my professional life, my, my, my marriage. And so I've always been a proponent. And when the pandemic struck, I kind of saw an opportunity to pursue my education without having to commute, being able to do it <laughs> online. And I said, let's go for it. So I'm currently in my second year at William James College. I'm, this is my final year. And um, I'm studying clinical mental health counseling with a emphasis in marriage and family therapy and a concentration in African and Caribbean mental health. So this is these are all of the intersections of everything that, that, that matter to me when it comes to mental health between uh, couples and family therapy and just the family dynamic, what happens to children and uh, how relationships impact uh, people's life, people's lives, and also African and Caribbean mental health. In that, uh, black communities typically have a stigma regarding mental health. Where if you go to seek mental health services, you're you might be viewed as crazy, or um, or you might be viewed negatively by your community. So I see my role as a pastor as an opportunity to positively impact my community, to help destigmatize mental health services, and to help them recognize that this is a part of health as well. Part of the emphasis in my church is we talk about physical health and how physical health yes. uh, impacts your wellness, impacts your life, right? But sometimes we skirt over how mental health plays into physical health, physical health as well. So um, having the opportunity to share with others is uh, something that's really precious to me, and, and it's, it's the reason I'm in it, I want to be able to to impact my community in a positive way. Wow, I mean, I think it's pretty remarkable that you basically you have this platform and you use it to give people the message that they need, the information that they need to kind of make their lives better, to help to break down the walls, um, to provide the information that people need in order to, um, I guess, uh, break the stereotype, break the stigma, mm -hmm. um, and to be emotionally healthy. Because right. um, if you imagine that that's what we would expect from our pastors mm -hmm. is that they're giving us the word, but they're kind of teaching us how to, to live. Right. 
as well. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. pastors hold a lot of weight in people's <laughs> lives, in their yeah. communities. Um, it's not something I really understood until I started pastoring. Even while pastoring, I didn't fully grasp <laughs> just how important a pastor is. Um, but even now, what we're seeing in uh, in the world with this controversy with the vaccine, mm-hmm. you know, there are religious leaders who are telling people don't get the vaccine. And mm-hmm. you, you can kind of sense how important or the, the kind of importance people put on what a pastor says. So mm-hmm. recognizing that, um, no, I'm a proponent of the vaccine. I'm vaccinated. I just want to put that out. And make that clear. <laughs> uh, I don't tell my church members not to get the vaccine, but I recognize this is an opportunity to help shape lives. Mm-hmm. And I try to make sure that my messages are practical, that mm-hmm. they're able to be applied on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So giving people tools to follow through on the principles that they're learning about is very important to me. Wow, wow. And um, you also wrote, a co-authored a book. Right. um, And uh, it's called Still Thirsty? Still Thirsty, Yes. yes. So it's the companion book for a book called Thirst, written by Dr. Wesley Knight, a good friend of mine. And um, the thirst is about... Um, it's about managing your sexuality in a healthy way. It's about recognizing that sex is not just about intercourse that happens between two people, but it's also very much about emotional needs that we're, that we, oftentimes we try to meet through the vehicle of sex. Uh, yeah. That sometimes what we really want is love or acceptance or intimacy or uh, something else that, that's a little existential mm-hmm. and sex is used as the medium by which people seek this. So uh, when Thirst was written, it was very impactful for me and for many others, And but many questions were still coming up. So Dr. Wesley Knight and I decided, let's write a companion book that starts to address more of the questions and help people recognize how to live out the principles of just being able to um, honor their sexuality in a way that that's not destructive, that's not harmful to themselves or to others. Oh, so it seems like there's a kind of a wide variety of things that you have uh, studied, spoken about, um, taught people about, discussed, written about. Um, and so I feel very fortunate to have you here. Um, and you know, as I mentioned in at the top of the hour, I'm, I'm, we're talking together about trauma in relationships. And, and part of the reason we had kind of decided to talk about this today was because sometimes in relationships, we don't, we can't, we don't recognize the ways that trauma shows up. Right. We we sometimes think about trauma as like an event, mm-hmm. something that happens, and then people might have specific things like nightmares or flashbacks, and those are the signs of trauma. But we may not realize that trauma is also something that impacts us interpersonally. Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes uh, the trauma that happens as a result of maybe uh, an issue within a relationship can then be carried to other relationships and right. it's not always described as trauma but the effects are there and exactly. so it's such an important thing to talk about um, and so tell us a little bit about you know um, I guess your thoughts on I guess in general just to, to, to just kind of kick us off on this topic of trauma and relationships definitely um, one of my favorite quotes is um, I'm forgetting who said it but they said trauma decontextualized in a person looks like personality or trauma Mm. decontextualized in a people looks like culture. And the the reason why that's so important, and I I hope to give credit to the person when when it comes back to me exactly who said it, um, the reason why that's so important is because you can have trauma playing out in your relationships, uh, in your family, dynamic and not even be aware of it mm-hmm. we hear things like oh that's just the way i am yeah or that's just the way we do things right and it's as if to say this is okay this is healthy and um it can be difficult for people to even recognize when everyone in your circle when mo- when a lot of the people in your uh in your in your community handle issues the same way or live life in the same way it can look like this is normal Mm -hmm. and then we hear these stories of people who make it out of certain environments and they they get to other places and they realize like whoa whoa things are different (laughs) and it's a bit of a culture shock because they realize what i thought was healthy what i called normal Mm -hmm. wasn't actually the best way to go about things um and that happens within relationships where you grow up in a home uh there are parents there there are siblings there and your home is teaching you how to operate within the world. Mm -hmm. It's teaching you about who you are within the world, how you are accepted, how to be loved, how to respect, how to show respect. Mm -hmm. 
and then you step out uh, out of your home and then you, you go to school you go to work and you realize not everybody has received the same training that i have received <laughs> and that could be a good thing that could be a bad there thing. we go yeah. so <laughs> um so when we're talking about trauma and relationships many relationships how we how we learn to relate to one another can be it is definitely informed by the home environment by the environments that we grow up in uh, by our childhood experiences and trauma can definitely de definitely plays a role for many people um, a recent study um, shows that at least 50% of children have had at least one significant traumatic experience. At least 50% of, of children yes. have had mm -hmm. at least one significant traumatic experience. experience. Yes, wow. so that means that, and, and the CDC believes that this is underreported. Yeah, of course, right. always. Trauma right. is always underreported. Of course, of yeah. course, who wants to talk about the negative things that have happened in their lives? Who even remembers some of the negative things that have happened in, in their lives? So, if at least fifty percent of adults have reported at least one significant traumatic exp traumatic experience in their childhood, that means that the chances of you or your partner having experienced trauma is very high. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe even both of you. Mm -hmm. And how does that trauma play out in the relationship? Wow, and that's you know, it's something that I think when people get together. They don't really think about because of course i imagine of course that that beginning stage of a relationship is just so joyful right. nobody's thinking about trauma right. or if they do talk about it it's kind of like this discussion where like oh they really understand me mm -hmm. um, but then at some point you realize there are some ways in which you don't understand each other mm -hmm. and definitely. you might be helpful to kind of get further in instruction mm -hmm. or guidance mm -hmm. yeah. definitely definitely and so for the purpose of this conversation i also want to make clear that the word trauma is just used so casually nowadays <laughs> uh, people say like i wasn't able to get my latte i was so traumatized <laughs> right or i wasn't able to uh, uh or even with the pandemic people are saying every everyone's being traumatized by it and to a degree that is there's some mm -hmm. truth there but mm -hmm. Trauma is it, there's such a tricky definition there. It, yeah. It's not a widely accepted definition for trauma just yet because of how trauma impacts different people di in a different way, in different ways. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, um, so there are three E's that are used to kind of help categorize trauma. There's the event, there's the experience, and then there are the effects. Mm -hmm. um, the event, the experience, and the effects. Yes. Okay. So several people can experience the same event true the event um which can be psychologically harmful or physically harmful um it can threaten life it, it's an event that is is challenging to the human psyche um or can risk even physical danger to the person that's the event right however not everyone will experience it the same way many times how a person experiences the event is based on their proximity to the event as well as where they are in, the, in their stage of development. Yeah. So what that means is, let's take 9-11 for example. 9-11 was a traumatic event for many, many people. Um, but for me, who grew up, born and raised in New York, I was in Queens, New York. From my middle school, I could see the smoke from the towers, right? I experienced what it was for um, my professor to just not be able to teach us as students mm -hmm. and he knew what was going on before we knew what was going on so he began to ask us like hey what do your parents do for a living mm -hmm. because he's trying to figure out do we have parents who live in the city do we have parents who work in the world trade center right that's mm -hmm. a traumatic experience for me as i as as we start hearing children's names called on the on the pa system and their parents mm -hmm. are picking them up from school early and taking them home and we're learning like it's a different experience for a new yorker than it is for someone who is saddened by the experience but they live in switzerland yeah. you know what i mean yeah. like it's, yeah. it's it, the same event but the experience is different how we make meaning of the experience uh, what it means to see that a, a classmate has lost a parent in that experience yeah. it impacts us differently so um there's the event there's the experience and that deals with uh, how we label it, the meaning that we assign to it, um, how it disrupts our lives and how long it disrupts our lives. And then there's also the effects and that deals with um, how, it, how, it, how it impacts our stress levels, um, how long it impacts our stress levels, and how we learn to manage life and relationships as a result of the event and our experience with that event. 
So those are the three E's that can help. No, that's, that's really helpful. Categorize yeah. uh, trauma. So what's traumatic for one may not be traumatic for another. Yeah, yeah. So. Wow. And, you know, it kind of makes me think about how sometimes as people, we can be so judgmental mm -hmm. of one another. Mm -hmm. um, because, as you mentioned, two people could potentially be in the same, even the same situation, mm -hmm. right? They, they're at the same event. They witnessed the same thing. They were standing side by side. Mm -hmm. And one person kind of, uh, you know, just collapses. And right. the other person can't look away. And then another person has to close their eyes. And everybody has kind of a different experience of mm -hmm. it. Then the effects, one person may end up right. not being able to sleep. Mm -hmm. The other person is able to kind of um, talk about it, and but they're able to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. And other person says in about a month, they're like, I don't know why everybody's still talking about this. It's, right. it's not bothering me anymore. Right. Um, some people have a delayed reaction, exactly. where initially they're like, I'm fine. And then three months later, they're like, I don't know why I'm crying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's so interesting how the effects can be different, the experience can be different, even if it's the same event. Right. Um, and it's important for people not to invalidate mm -hmm. the other person mm -hmm. if they're in a relationship and they are thinking, well, I went through childhood abuse too, mm -hmm. you just have to deal with it or something right. like that. And right. it's kind of, you know, a bit invalidating for the other mm -hmm. person's experience. Yeah, definitely. And when we don't know what they've been through, when we don't know what happened to them, it can be very easy to assume that because I had a similar experience, mm -hmm. you should be just fine. Right? Exactly. So like something else that we can say sometimes that can be invalidating is like everything's going to work out mm. or pr just pray about it. And while, you know, spiritual support, it can be helpful in a person finding relief and finding support. Um, we don't want to minimize the person's experience because when you minimize someone's experience, you don't understand what they've been through. And when you don't, when you don't understand what they've been through, you're not going to understand why they are who they are or the way they are or why they respond to challenges or stress or um or or or, or provocations mm -hmm. the way that they do wow so kind of seek to understand definitely and then see them kind of for see their own problems uh, even if they had something similar to yours to kind of allow them to go through their own process and it kind of makes me think about as a psychiatrist i often am thinking about what is a solution mm -hmm. and i was just thinking about this this morning that for different people, even if they have the exact same trauma, mm -hmm. even their treatment will differ. Definitely. Some people, they benefit from talking about it. Mm -hmm. And talking about it is getting their story out. Mm -hmm. It's their path to healing. Mm -hmm. And there are other people, they have either nothing to say mm -hmm. or talking about it is not helpful. Mm -hmm. And they, their solution is different. And there can be any kind of myriad number of solutions, which kind of speaks to how kind of going back to what you said, people experience it differently and the effects are different and therefore even the solution can right. be different. So, you know, I imagine that then in a couple, one person would say, hey, what worked for me was I got exercise. I went, I started training for a marathon and that helps me heal from right. my trauma. Right. And the other person says, running doesn't help me. Mm -hmm. I need to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine there being a mismatch when one person and the couple wants to talk right. and the other person does not want to talk. They right. want to just go, you know, mm -hmm. play a sport or mm -hmm. something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be challenging. It's it's a very interesting dynamic because many times in relationships, people like to blame the other person. It's your fault that, that mm -hmm. the relationship is like this. When relationships are dynamic and that it's like a rubber band, you mm -hmm. can't pull on one end without affecting the other. Yeah, so yeah. the dynamic of the relationship is not only impacted by one person's actions. There is a repercussion on the other end and there is a response on that end that further either enforces the relationship dynamic or begins to change the relationship mm -hmm. dynamic. Mm -hmm. So um, many times when I'm counseling couples, I, I provide um, premarital uh, couples therapy, I provide marital therapy as well. I'm, I encourage couples to recognize that though they are individuals, they are bringing a history with them. Mm -hmm. The same way when you see a medical doctor, the medical doctor will ask you, you know, is there a history of cancer in your family? Is there a history of this disease or that disease? Because that history may inform their treatment as well as give them clarity on what's happening with you. Mm -hmm. the, same is ha the same happens in relationships. There's a history there mm -hmm. where your parents, your home environment, your childhood experiences, your recent experiences even, can definitely play a role in how you manage the relationship that you're in. So 
I often tell couples, you know, spend some time getting to know the family as well. Because sometimes you need to meet mom, you need to meet dad, you need to meet some brothers or sisters to get better understand. Like, that's why they do it. I, <laughs> this gets on my nerves. It right? all clicks now. <laughs> it all makes sense. And then also, I think it heightens our ability to be compassionate with one another. When mm-hmm. we realize, like, oh, you're not doing this to annoy me. This is all you've ever experienced. Like, <laughs> it's kind of easier to be like, all right, okay, I can, I can show you some grace. I can be a little compassionate about what you're dealing with. Because I recognize that you're coming from somewhere with this it's not necessarily about me for those of you that are just joining you're listening to black mental health matters i'm dr karen williams and i'm here with edsel cadet um, and we're talking about trauma in relationships if you have any questions or comments give us a call at 617-238-7111 that's 617-238-7111 we're also live on facebook you can go to the facebook live stream on uh, urban heat 981 fm um, or Urban Heat, yeah, Urban Heat 981FM. So um, drop a comment there um, and just let us know if you have any questions or if you have any thoughts about how you have seen trauma affect relationships, how that has played out um, in your observation. You know, as you mentioned history, Edsel, um, I was thinking about a, a, a book that I had read on relationships. And one thing that it, they said that it stood out to me was that these kinds of like intimate uh, uh, kind of, I guess what you call primary attachment, Mm -hmm. a primary attachment figure. So somebody who you kind of rely on, somebody that makes you feel safe, Mm -hmm. that makes you feel loved, that makes you feel accepted, Mm -hmm. that there there are only a few people in a person's life that fit that characteristic. Mm -hmm. One are your parents. They were your first kind of primary attachment Mm -hmm. figure and a lot of times people go through life and they never have another kind of very primary attachment figure until they have a relationship. Mm. And that that's part of the reason why um, we, you, per, sometimes people can say, gosh, when they're in relationships, they're a different person. Right. You know, when, they, when you just have a friendship with them or if they're a coworker, they seem like one kind of person, but there's something about the primary attachment. So when they get, when they get into this relationship, it brings up all this stuff mm-hmm. from their a, a primary relationship with their parents because right. that's it's it's a relationship that kind of mimics that this is you're supposed to feel safe mm-hmm. did they feel safe with their parents you're supposed to feel accepted right. did you feel accepted with your parents you're mm-hmm. supposed to feel loved mm-hmm. did you feel loved by your parents so it kind of brings all that stuff back up have you seen that kind of dynamic then play yes. out <laughs> yes, almost every time every yeah. time right? so one of the things that happens and I, this is very important we have nervous systems that are designed to help keep us safe mm-hmm. uh, that we don't choose when to activate them they activate even when we're children when we are what's called dysregulated our nervous system or nervous notices something's not right it begins to act out in such a way where it can either draw parental support so that you can begin to find comfort so a baby is hungry right the nervous system realizes okay we need food how do we get food we can't communicate we can't get up and go to the food we can't open the fridge we can't cook what can we do we cry right the ba- the, fa- the father or mother or guardian uncle whoever it is that's around comes and begins to meet the need mm-hmm. and the baby begins to learn from a very young age okay this is this is a means of regulating my needs of me- having my needs met and regulating my nervous system so one of the things that happens a lot in relationships is that that primary caregiver the model that they give you of love of care of support um plays a major role in showing you how to receive love from others and how to have your needs met as well um so for example when you grow up when when a child may might get a little bit older and it grows up let's suppose um there's a scenario where there's uh a, a man and a woman they're dating they're they're getting to know each other they're in a relationship um, and they grew up in two different households. He grew up in a household that was fairly explosive when it comes to communication and conflict. Lots of yelling, lots of screaming, uh, maybe even even spurts of violence uh, in order to communicate their need, in order to resolve conflict. Whereas for her, uh, she grew up in a household that was uh, healthier when it comes to managing conflict. They would talk about things, they would work through it, they had a consistent, safe environment. Uh, For him, when there was conflict, somebody would leave the home for days, maybe even weeks. For her, when there was conflict, they worked through it, 
people stayed where they were, mm -hmm. they're learning different things about how the world how the world works and how they work within the world. Mm -hmm. uh, he's learning that in order to have my needs acknowledged and in order to have my needs met, maybe I need to be explosive, maybe I need to yell, maybe I need to scream. Um, not everybody responds to trauma in the same way though. Some people see that very same environment and say, I need to retreat, I need to hide. Uh, if I'm smaller and unnoticeable, then it won't come my way. Right. Um, two siblings living in that same household can respond to the trauma in two very yeah. different ways, right? But now this young lady meets this guy, right? And he's learned the way that I have my need met is uh, I I I get loud. I get I get you know exuberant. Like I'm expressing myself a lot. Um, I might even raise my voice. I might even become intimidating. I, I might even have an inclination to get a little violent, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas for her, she hasn't learned any of those things. She's learned I'm going to express my emotions. I'm going to express my needs, and you're going to res and I hope that you respond to my needs. Um, that's a relational dynamic that is going to be challenging when it comes to communication. That's going to it's going to be challenging when it comes to conflict management, mm -hmm. but. Understanding where it comes from can go a long way to helping the individuals understand why uh, why they why they respond in the way that they do. Um, so, kind of bringing it to the present. Let's give a scenario where they're in conflict. Uh, let's suppose they're living together, and um, he doesn't take the trash out. <laughs> right? Oh boy! Simple thing. It's not. It's not the end of the world, you know. And not it, uncommon. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's not uncommon, and it doesn't need to be the end of a relationship. However, um, she's frustrated. This is the fiftieth time that she's, you know, she's 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 done things around the house to help out. She's asked him, please take out the trash. And now she's upset. Now she's expressing herself a little bit more. What happens is that his brain begins to scan the situation to see is this familiar or is this unfamiliar and the same way that he growing up would scan the situation and see um, his nervous system would, his, and his brain would, would work together to scan the situation and see okay there's potential danger here how do I respond to that he's going to respond most likely to that circumstance in the way that he was in the way that was modeled to him in his childhood right mm -hmm. so there's something that happens um, called the amygdala hijack oh. um, where I was just gonna say I was thinking about the neurological kind right. of like thing is like going back to it go ahead yeah so, um, just two parts of the brain I want to talk about briefly there's the neocortex uh, it's kind of like the first layer of brain at the top of your head and then there's the amygdala which is uh, like a almond size part of your brain closer to the center of the brain the neocortex is where you do all of your reasoning it's where you do your critical thinking it's 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 how you really process and perceive the world on an intellectual level whereas the amygdala doesn't wait for all of that information the amygdala is operating on instinct it's operating on past memories it is a def it's there to help you uh, help your nervous system uh, uh, operate in such a way where it doesn't have to process too much in order to react the amygdala is very helpful because uh, if you've been in a dangerous situation in your past, maybe there was a fire somewhere and you, you, you escape the fire. The second time you see that fire, your brain is not working through your neocortex to process that. It's going straight to the amygdala, you're, you're, you, you, you smell the smoke, you're up and moving probably before you even know it, it because it's taking over. Uh, it's what happens when we have a fight or flight response or even freeze where it's like the brain goes into hyperdrive at least within the amygdala and it's just working for your survival in that instance. Uh, the neocortex actually begins to shut down to a degree mm -hmm. where you're not doing so much thinking, you're not doing so much processing. This is why people say like, I was doing this before I even thought about it. Mm -hmm. You weren't really thinking about it. Yeah. The amygdala took over and it was working for your survival. And this is how we learn to manage and to, and to respond to stress. Now, the issue and the problem with that, well, it's a benefit when it comes to, to dangerous situations. The challenge is that when we've learned to respond to stress uh, through our amygdala, recognizing a potential conflict, and now we flare up, we get angry, we, get, we have these angry outbursts, you can often end up saying or doing things before you even fully process it yeah because the neurocortex even blood begins to drain from the neurocortex and heads to the amygdala and heads to the other parts of the body to prepare you for fight or for flight 
um, your muscles get more blood, uh, adrenaline is released into the body, cortisol is released into the body to prepare you for a fight. Um, so one of the challenges that happens is that in a conflict, let's say this gentleman, he, he's sca his amygdala is scanning now. Mm -hmm. She's angry. I've seen this before. I know what this is like. I've seen mom and dad act like this before, and I know that this is not safe. So now, even before his neocortex begins to kick in and say, no, 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 we have a loving relationship. We get along well. You know, before all of that happens, his amygdala may, may take over. That's why it's called the amygdala hijack and take over. And now he's responding um, from a survival mechanism rather than a way that, that reflects the nature of the relationship. Um, so I hope that that adds some depth and some understanding to, to how conflict can unfold yeah. in ways that we don't expect. And people can say, I, I said things that, that I, w I wouldn't normally say. Yeah. I wasn't thinking when I said that. Or I wasn't thinking when I did that. And they don't even recognize that they're probably being more truthful than they realize. Because yeah. on some level, the neocortex wasn't operating and they weren't thinking. And I imagine that if you... Um if you're placed in a, a situation over and over, like how the, what would happen in childhood, mm -hmm. you have basically um, developed those pathways mm -hmm. in your brain right. um, that you that becomes a well-worn path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it becomes difficult then, even after a person begins to realize that that's the reason why they say and do the things they say and do, mm -hmm. it's still difficult to sometimes stop because it is a well-worn path. It, it is, is. It's become your brain's default. Exactly. Um, and it does take some work, but people can learn to, to do better. Definitely. Definitely. It's like a highway that, it's like a highway in your brain that's trained you to respond to conflict or to stress in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And in your relationship, you're trying to beat a new path. Yeah. And the, the, the highway is just a faster way. It, yeah. It's just going to operate faster. So uh, therapy will help you form a new path, a healthier path that will be beneficial to the relationship. Um, so understanding what is happening in his mind, in his brain, what is being triggered within him yeah. can help her recognize, okay, his response is inappropriate, but it's also his response is not fully about me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there are people in relationships who they're in conflict and they begin to realize like, this is not about me. Yeah. Like there's a response here that is about his past, that is about mm -hmm. her past, that is about something that I had nothing to do with, mm -hmm. but now I'm here and feeling the repercussions for that, uh, of, of that history. So, uh, so many times people need to, to, need to recognize like, mm -hmm. wow, I'm responding to a perceived threat in my relationship because of what I experienced in my childhood. And when people begin to realize this, instead of just saying, like, this is who I am, this is the way we do things, and <laughs> or they say, this is how real, real men or real women or real people deal with these kinds of things, mm -hmm. um, when you begin to provide that context, you can recognize, like, okay, this is not healthy, and this is not something I want to pass down to my children. Yeah, and even if it was real in your life growing up, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean that it is the true way that things should right. be done um, and I, it just kind of makes me think you know um, for those that are uh, you know kind of listening in uh, when we talk about the neocortex um, the other thing to know about it is that it is responsible uh, you probably said this already but like it's responsible for like planning mm -hmm. cause and effect right. organizing and it is really supposed to be that check and balance mm -hmm. on that amygdala. Mm -hmm. So when people are, you know, rise up to have an emotional reaction, that neocortex is designed to like put the brake pedal right. and kind of say, slow down, mm -hmm. stop, think, don't say anything yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so when that is weak, that check and balance is right. is kind of gone. And, and it's interesting because, you know, I work with kids and we see that happen with small children because for children, that's just normal brain development. That part of the brain develops first. Mm -hmm. So we see that small children are very much overrun by their emotions and they're not really good at planning things out and inhibiting their impulses. And as they get older, by the time they're 24, 25, that part of the brain should be much better. Right. 
I mean, still there's some trouble, but it should be much better at kind of controlling impulses and, and helping you to plan and to kind of overcome your emotions, to stop and think. Um, it's part of the reason why I think, I want to say car insurance is higher for young people mm -hmm. um, until they get to a certain age and then um, it kind of drops because there's more car accidents because right. people are just impulsive um, mm -hmm. up to a certain age um, and beyond, <laughs> beyond really. Um, yeah. But I like what you mentioned about, you know, in that situation with the relationships, understanding what the other person needs mm -hmm. in that moment, mm -hmm. which starts with knowing that when they have this reaction, when they have this blow up, it's not really about you anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially when you see it being that big and disproportionate, mm -hmm. You're, you have to kind of wonder, well, something's not right. Um, this is too big of a reaction for what actually happened. Mm -hmm. This has gone way beyond what we're actually dealing with in the present. Right. Um, and so thinking about how to work with each other in that moment exactly. and knowing what the other person needs. Yeah. So then that that woman would need to know what her husband needs in that moment when he gets that angry. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because her temptation very naturally is gonna, her response to his bravado, his threatening posture is, mm. well, I'm gonna get bigger as well. I'm yeah. gonna get louder, I'm gonna, and now she's further triggering, triggering his stress response system that's informed by his traumatic past. And it's actually bringing them farther away from resolution and from what they both desire. Mm -hmm. So for one of them to recognize like, okay, I need to help him regulate. Yeah. Or I need to play a role that will help bring the relationship um, back to normal levels mm -hmm. so that we can actually get to what we want. Um, one of the things that, that don't know me in studying this is that because the neocortex controls uh, creativity and critical thinking and all of these other important intellectual <laughs> aspects of the relationship, people often fall in love with the neocortex version of their of their mate, right, oh, of their partner. Yeah. But the, when it comes to conflict, the person you're fighting with is the amygdala. Right. You know, you're fighting with. It's a good way to describe it. Right. You know, some people, you know, they they will marry the neocortex. They they'll divorce the amygdala. Yeah. So that's why it's so important. You know, I see people rushing into relationships, and I'm like, or they say, oh, we've never had a fight and they think not yet. That, that, you know <laughs> not yet and they think that that's a good thing and it's so important to see for your partner how do they respond to stress yeah who are they under pressure um how do they respond to the feelings of being attacked and when you see that, that that's going to be a component of the relationship because we live in a world that is chaotic there, there's going to be conflict there are going to be challenges so learning about that and recognizing and learning also through therapy or through uh, marriage uh, therapy or counseling learning how to respond to that and where that comes from can really go a long way because unfortunately when we don't deal with these things you can find two very good people who are well mated well matched uh, who are good for each other on a certain level, but because of unhealed trauma, they mm -hmm. cannot coexist. They cannot make the relationship work. And it's one of the saddest things that I see from time to time as a, as a pastor, as a therapist. I see, I'm like, you guys have the tools, yeah. but because of what happened to you, because of who raised you, because of your experiences, and because that has gone largely unaddressed, what you have now, you can't even honor in a, in a, in a way that, that, that would bring you happiness. Um, yeah. so, so one of the other ways that we see this unfolding is um, in communication, where, um, and this happens all the time within communication, uh, where you can just kind of see the neocortex fading <laughs> to the background and the amygdala <laughs> rising up, right? Um, where there's an issue. And then, so let's say the issue again, it's taking out the trash. Uh, he didn't take out the trash. So that's the issue. The issue is that he didn't take out the trash. However, then there's the offendee's response to the issue. Mm -hmm. So the person who's offended, their response to the issue. Their response can be healthy and like, hey, you know, this really troubles me when you don't do this. It makes me feel undervalued, underappreciated. They're, that would be really great you know, if people could talk like that in real life. Amazing, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but in order to talk like that, there's a certain level of processing that has to yeah. go on where you feel the emotion, you're cognitively processing it, and you're recognizing, okay, okay this is what it's invoking in me. This is mm -hmm. the meaning I've made of the situation. Uh, and you're expressing that to your, to your partner. Uh, but what often happens is the, the offendee, because they're offended, they'll say something offensive, right? Exactly. So they'll say, ah, That's more realistic. You know, mm. like, I can't stand you. You're so unreliable. You're so stupid. Da, 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 da. Like they begin to throw labels, right? Yeah. So there's the issue, and there's the offendee's response to the issue, which can be disrespectful, which can be hurtful, which can, which can be dismissive. 
Then there's the offenders, the original offender's response, not to the issue, but to the offendee's reaction. Yes. So now he responded. He says, I can't stand you. I do so much around here and you never appreciate dot, 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 right? So now the, the, the communication is breaking down because now the, the next step that often happens is that the communication conflict becomes about the reactions to the issue rather than the, the issue, issue itself. So now, wow. I can't believe you called me stupid. I can't believe you say I don't appreciate you. And the conflict now takes on a second, uh, I guess, life where it's, it's now dealing with, I can't believe you responded to me this way. Yeah. And I've seen many couples where the amygdala is in, is, is in overdrive. Uh, the stress response is not working in a way that is, um, th- that is helpful to them. And now they're fighting about their reactions to an issue. Mm-hmm. That fight can last so long because both people feel justified. We've mm-hmm. both been offended. We've both been hurt. We're both expressing our frustrations about how we how we feel. Like it's hard to see how I'm wrong when you did me wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. So that fight can last for for a long time, and then resolution shows up, or resolution happens about the reactions, and many times not about the issue which is a destructive cycle for the relationship because now that one person has apologized for calling the other one stupid the other one has apologized for calling the other person unappreciative and the trash is still not taken out the trash (laughs) is still not taken out so now next week it happens again because they didn't resolve the issue they didn't create a plan about how we were going to follow through on this resolution and hold each other accountable and now when the fight happens again, it feels like no progress has been made. Um. So one of the things I love to help couples do is to help them bypass that whole off-ramp of just fighting about the response and actually get to a point where you're processing what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, what I'm experiencing, the meaning <coughs> that I'm making of it, mm-hmm. and then I'm learning to communicate that to my spouse or to my partner. That was, that was an amazing kind of run through <laughs> of how communication goes awry. That was amazing. So just I'm going to do kind of a like quick like recap is that you have an issue and then there is a response to the issue, which can either be healthy, I guess I'll say helpful or unhelpful. Right. Um, when the response is unhelpful, <laughs> then the other person is responding to that person's unhelpful response we go. and the issue itself gets lost mm-hmm. and people are kind of getting caught up in their emotional reactions mm-hmm. and at some point they resolve the emotional issue but the primary issue right. which was in this case the taking the trash out mm-hmm. is not resolved so that when that issue comes back up again it feels like there's no progress being right. made exactly. and they feel like they're stuck yes yes so people can often get lost in that and just feel like, okay, we're not making any progress. We're having the same fights over and over again. We're, we're, we're not growing as a couple. They begin to label this when in reality, they, they need to learn a common language for both processing their emotions and their feelings and then also communicating that mm-hmm. um, so that they could be more self-directed rather than the amygdala kind of hijacking the whole process and now they're running off of or they're operating off of off of a survival mechanism. So one thing one thing that I teach couples is um, I teach them this communication technique called, uh, which is also a conflict management technique called I messages, where they begin to process what's going on with them. There are three steps to the I message uh, for the first step has three steps. So it's I feel blank when blank because blank, and now the offended party has to begin to process. It's it's a tedious process, it's a slow process, but it's designed to be that way. Mm-hmm. So that the communication and conflict management can be effective, so that it can be strategic. And then also it's a skill. So the longer you do it, the more you do it, the better you get at it, the faster you become. But it's a, help, it's a helpful and healthy way for many couples to communicate what's going on within them. So I feel blank emotion, right? And like, uh, many times we have trouble labeling our negative emotions. People don't want to say that they feel sad, right? Yeah. So they'll say, uh, I feel like that was dumb, right? Mm. That's not an emotion. <laughs> I feel like that was rude. That's not an emotion, right? But you want to identify an emotion. I feel sad. I feel disappointed. I feel hurt. I feel angry. Um, I feel all of those things. Mm-hmm. When? 
and then you label the action that has actually contributed to that to that feeling because many times people are fighting and they don't they're not even fighting about the same thing they're not talking about the same thing mm-hmm. or the, the 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 conversation ends and he or she is still not clear on what do i need to do to avoid this in the future right, right? so it causes the person the offended party label it mm-hmm. when you do dot 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 and then because the because is probably the most meaningful part for so many people because there is an interpretation of the action that is playing into their response Mm -hmm. so when they get into the because i challenge couples to process what does this remind you of or how have you interpreted this through the lens of your experience your culture uh your family values the 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 leaving so so for him he might say I just forgot to take out the trash. But for her, she might interpret that because of her culture, because of her background. She might say, no, when you don't take out the trash, it means you don't value me. Mm. And he has no idea that that's what his actions are communicating. He just thinks, it's just trash. It's just trash. What are we talking about? When for her, it is not just trash. It means you haven't thought of me. I asked you to do this. I put in so work, so much work in our in our relationship. I just want to know that you remember me and that you do this one thing for me, mm-hmm. or vice versa. She might say, he might say, oh, um, she might say, oh, I just used the word, and he's like, no, but that's disrespectful, and that disrespect to me means that you don't value me. So one thing I love about the I messages is you can't just automatically something happens and you just respond. No, no, mm-hmm. you got to process. What am I feeling? Okay, what did they do that made me feel this way? Okay, what does it remind me of? Or how am I interpreting it? Because my interpret my interpretation is impacting my experience. Yeah. It is not necessarily their intent, but it is definitely my interpretation. Yeah. And one of the things that, that that the other partner can do, the offender can do to now strengthen that regulation is that they can begin uh, repeating back what the other person has said and that's a way of of helping of co-regulating helping Mm -hmm. a person whose stress response uh, has has been activated actually repeating back what they said and saying so what I'm hearing you say is you feel blank when blank because blank Uh, let me fill in the blanks Uh, what I'm hearing you say is that you feel undervalued and not seen when I don't take out the trash because you put in so much effort into this relationship and this for you has become a symbol of how I care for you, right? Well, I feel like it would take a while to get to that point in most relationships. <laughs> it might take, you know, I just, I, I imagine that it's, it's, it's just not a natural way for us to think that mm-hmm. clearly, mm-hmm. especially in the moment. Right. Um, I imagine in a situation like that, there may even be individual therapy that's needed for right. someone to learn how to mm-hmm. identify their own emotional states mm-hmm. too because sometimes people are actually um uh, i guess the word um there's a technical term for it but basically they have difficulty at describing their emotions right. and then you know of course the actual relationship therapy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but i also wanted to ask too not to interrupt you but okay. are there times where it might actually be helpful for people to calm down before having that discussion right because i imagine if that's just happened Mm -hmm. they're in Mm -hmm. kind of that amygdala hijack they're in the middle of that right so they might actually need to like take a time out from one another definitely slow their breathing down Mm -hmm. and then come back together and have this very logical conversation (laughs) it might be very helpful but there needs to be conversation about about taking it take Pardon me about taking a break or calling a timeout mm-hmm. because for one person if you grown grown up in a home where in the midst of conflict people left you oh and yeah. now your partner is disengaging emotionally or they're walking out or they're storming out you that can trigger a further response for you so True. there has to be a conversation about what does this mean how long do we typically take um you know how do we show or communicate to the person like i'm taking a break for me i'm not leaving you so those are things that we'll work through and we'll create some common language so that people know how so that the couple knows how to properly interpret the 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 break or the walkout because some people might say oh she's giving me the silent treatment (laughs) and it's it's not necessarily that but there should be a, a, a previous communication about what this means, how do we interpret it, and how will I continue to honor the relationship even if I have to disengage emotionally or physically for a few moments. 
Wow, wow. And so as we kind of um, g- kind of uh, come to a close a, a bit, um, oh, I, there was actually one comment from Facebook that I missed um, okay. from uh, one of my previous guests, Deborah Jackson. She said, attachment style is real and sometimes why we play out strategies we had with our parents, with our partner, even though those strategies are not effective mm-hmm. for that relationship. Um, so she's kind of just um, validating what I had mentioned earlier about the attachment. Definitely. Um, and I wanted to just ask if there's any kind of like final kind of comments or things that you wanted to leave with the listeners about trauma in relationships and maybe some hope for us and, and things like that. Definitely. Um, so uh, one, I'm a huge proponent of premarital, I would even say pre, uh, pre-engagement counseling. <laughs> yeah. Like my wife and I, we got counseling before we got engaged because so many times you know people they 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 propose then they post the pictures they send out the invitations (laughs) and then they say oh let's go to counseling and find out you know (laughs) how to make this work and it's like no 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 and that that's challenging it it can still work it can Mm -hmm. still work but it's challenging because couples will feel immense pressure to keep it going even if therapy reveals this is not a good match this is sure. not healthy because you've already sent out all the wedding invitations you know, <laughs> you're posting the picture you're showing the ring it's like you're already shopping for the dresses right. how do you then tell people like hey this is not it, gonna work right? yeah so i i really advocate pre, pre-engagement if not pre-engagement premarital uh, if not premarital, then marital, marital. you know. Whatever, you, take what you can get. Take what you can get. <laughs> um, I also want to recommend a few books. Uh, recently, I've been reading What Happened to You by Bruce Perry and Oprah Ooh, Winfrey. Oh, yeah. Oh, I haven't gotten to that one, but I've read the other Bruce Perry books, and they're really good. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So uh, it's titled What Happened to You, and it goes into childhood experiences, adverse childhood experiences. It goes into childhood trauma and how those things impact uh, how we live, how we how we live, how we see the world, how we understand ourselves. I think it can provide uh, people with a lot of insight into what's going on with them, as well as what might be going on with their family members and their friends. So, um, what I do want to say is this: the amygdala does not have to rule. Mm. Um, the, another pathway can be built. The therapeutic relationship is a critical component to helping people uh, re-engage traumatic experiences. Uh, to process them and to learn adaptive ways to work through them uh, both individually and also within their relationships so you know if you're listening to this if you're watching this and you realize like wow this is this is what's been going on with me uh, this is the first step to healing this is the first step to 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 having a healthier lifestyle and something that 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 can bring, help bring you joy so I encourage you go on the journey uh, find a therapist read a few books uh, try to get into friendship relationships or even other kinds of relationships that restore uh, your faith in humanity, your faith in hope and love and peace and joy and, and, the, and the good things of life, in faith and in spirituality, all of those things that help support and contribute to your well-being. I encourage you to start that journey and to start cultivating relationships that can help bring you along. Wow. Well, well, thank you so much for, for joining me on the show today, Edsel. Um, I'm going to try to c- convince him to come back again next week to talk a little bit more because there's so many areas that he specializes in. And thank you to all the listeners out there um, that listen in. You've been listening to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams, and I'll be back on again next Sunday at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time here on heat981fm.com. So have a great week. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the show today. For more on Black mental health, you can go to my website, drkerryann.net. That's D-R-K-E-R-R-Y-A-N-N dot net. You can also follow me on Instagram, also at drkerryann. And tune in every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on heat981fm.com. Have a great week.